Good afternoon. Totally different change of direction, as Les says. I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about the delights of volcano speleology, the exploration of uh, caves formed by volcanic processes and in volcanic rocks. And in particular, I'm going to talk to you about the, the most extensive and most important of these sorts of caves, lava tube caves. I've been a caver for just over 30 years, and for about half that time, I've been drawn to caves formed under volcanoes, like the rather smashing popper. Popper, but why didn't I put a picture of Etna in? Popper Catapetl in Mexico. And I've been fortunate enough to see some fantastic places, such as the rather magnificent Manjangle lava tube, shown on the left-hand side of the screen here, which is in Jeju Island in the Republic of Korea. Sometimes, just in case you do hear the term, lava tubes is not the only term by which these cavities are known. In the scientific community, the term pyroduct has been catching on for the last few years, but I, I've always referred to them as lava tubes because I'm a simple sort of lad, really. It's long been known that caves form in, lava, in volcanic rocks. And for those of you with a literary bent, that rather pleasant mountain there is Snaefels, where... According to Jules Verne, uh, is the shaft that Hans Lindenbrock descended to the centre of the Earth. Now, as volcano speleologists, we've yet to penetrate quite that far. And in fact, there is no big shaft on the top of that volcano. There are a myriad of very fine caves around it, though, lava tubes. I think there's about 100, if I remember correctly. So we may not have got to the core of the Earth... But I would say that, as volcano speleologists, we have found a lot of amazing things. And in particular, British cavers have had a major part to play, both in the exploration and in the science of how lava tubes form. So, virtually all of the other caves described by the presenters over this weekend have formed slowly, drip by drip, in, ro in sedimentary rocks like limestone. The methods of formations of lava tubes couldn't be any more different than this. They form in the matter of weeks, maybe months, but they're also, it's in, with a limestone cave, the rock forms, and then at some point in the future, the cave forms within that rock. You know, there was, there was a mention earlier about it being remarkable that caves had started forming within a million years of the rock forming. Not like that here. The caves are forming with the rock. In fact, for basaltic lava flows... These tubes are actually the primary mechanism by which the lava flows extend away from the volcano. They are absolutely massively important in the formation of the new rock and new land in places like Hawaii and Iceland. And these things are amazing. They can be watched and being formed. They're being formed at the moment on the slopes of Kilauea on, on Hawaii. The lava inside them is typically at a temperature of about 1,100 degrees Celsius, fairly warm, and that temperature doesn't change. They're insulated. The lava is insulated dramatically. Measurements can be taken from skylights kilometres apart, and the temperature does not change. That's why they are the method by which these lava, the, the lava flows extend. I'm going to particularly draw your attention to the photo on the right here which was taken in the Mauna Ula eruption on Hawaii almost 50 years ago, 1969, by my good friend Chris Wood. And the reason I bring that up is because Chris will, will feature quite a lot in this presentation. British volcano speleology can really be said to have begun in the, late 19, in the early 1970s. And specifically, through the influence of this guy, the late Dr. Christopher Wood very good friend of mine, seen here, sat in a one, rather wonderful cave called Cueva de la Iglesia in Morelos in Mexico, which we explored together in 2006. But back in the 70s, as a young UK caver, Chris was drawn away from the cold, wet mud of British caving and started a series of weekends, long weekend trips to nice, hot, sunny places with big caves. Seems really sensible, doesn't it? One of these visits in 1973 was to Tenerife. You know, and I suspect a lot of people here have been on package trips to Tenerife. And Chris was drawn there because there were 
descriptions of large caves in the lava. So they went and visited, and sure enough, they did. They found, they, in particular, they followed up leads to, a, to the Cave of the Winds, Cueva del Viento, which was reckoned to be quite extensive. So this small team, they, they set about surveying this cave. And, uh, excuse me, and uh, what they found was that the cave was indeed very extensive, and they were producing a very fine survey. And Chris's attention was drawn to a small crawl shown on a sketch that a few of the local cavers had made. And he, this, this small crawl was drafting. And here it is. Now, anyone who's been in a lava tube knows that anything like that, it may not be tight, but it is pretty bloody desperate. This stuff is sharp. It's more or less glass. Wonderful quotes from a relative newbie at lava tubing a few years ago. God, he said, this is just like swimming naked in a bottle bank. Every movement is painful. Everything catches. The friction is phenomenal. You're, not, you're, you're, you're closed, and if you're unlucky, your skin is snagging and getting torn with every motion. But Chris, being hard and one of the old school, pushed this crawl because it had that, that, that um, most intriguing of properties, a strong cold draft. And what happened? He followed this crawl, not only for a few metres, and he came to the top of a small shaft. This was easily climbed, it was seven metres deep. And he popped out into this. The so-called Galleria de los Ingleses. Fabulous piece of cave. This was a whole new level to the Cueva del Viento. Best bit of the cave by miles. It's a fabulous place. Terrific lava formations, most of it huge passage. And more to the point, they added four kilometres to the length of the cave. Why was that important? Because that made it, at the time, the world's longest lava tube. This was quite a coup for British cavers. Up until then, it had largely been American cavers who were pushing caves in the continental, uh, lava tube caves in the continental U uh, USA. But here we had some British cavers finding the world's longest lava tube. In the years since, the cave has continued to grow. There has been more and more um, determined exploration. British cavers have been involved. And in fact, Les sat down here, goes over there pretty regularly to go and drink the bit, sorry, explore these caves. And they're intending to push this cave further. There are some terrific features, like this huge boulder in the passage. If you look closely, it's not a loose boulder. It's attached to the floor. It's what's known as a, a lava ball, rather like a snowball, this, um, this rock would have been pushed along by the lava river and accreted layers of extra lava. You can start to see the power of the lava river in this cave. But as of today, Cueva del Viento boasts some 18 kilometres of passage. It's the fifth longest lava tube known in the world. It is the longest lava tube known outside of Hawaii. Fabulous cave. Quite a complex plan to it, as you can see there. And the potential is still phenomenal. These same lavas flow all the way under the town of Ico de los Vinos, down to the coast at San Marcos. There's miles and miles and miles of caves still to be found here. So how do you top finding the world's longest lava tube? Well, in Chris's case, he, went, he got very, very interested in the scientific formation, and he became one of the leading lights, in fact, probably the leading light, in the science of volcanospeleogenesis the study of the formation of lava tube caves. And he went on to explore lava tube caves in Iceland, um, in Africa, uh, Sicily, all over the world. But um, I first bumped into him whilst caving in, of all places, Slovenia, one of the great limestone caving areas of the world. And on this trip, Chris waxed lyrical about lava tubes, and in particular about an expedition he was planning to Iceland. And this was to look at the look for caves in the lavas formed by the great Larky eruption of 1783. This eruption, a 27 kilometer long crack in the earth opened up and 15 kilometers of cubic kilometers of lava was spewed out. Tremendous. One of the, you know, it is the biggest eruption in recorded history. But there were next to no caves known in the, in the lava, despite the fact contemporary accounts describing what were clearly lava tubes in formation. So Chris persuaded me and he said, 
You're going over there, you don't need to bring all that heavy caving kit in the UK. There's no pitches. It's dry. It'll be a bit sharp, but don't bring your wellies, don't bring an oversuit. And the first cave I, was at, I went in, I was confronted by this. So, several kilometres walk from where we, the nearest place we could get the vehicles, and we've got a bloody streamway. So we start off, only two of us, me and Chris, everybody else said, I'm not getting my feet wet. So we balanced, rock to rock, then that ceased to be an option and got our feet wet. The water got deeper, it got up to about waist deep. This is in Iceland, so it ain't warm. And the passage got narrower and we came to a small boulder choke. But what was remarkable was the other side of this boulder choke was an incredible roaring noise. Now, this was clearly a lot of water falling. So, up to our waists, in cold water in Iceland, we pulled a few rocks out and popped out into this. These chambers, I say, streamways in lava tubes are not that rare. Quite frequently, a lava tube will capture the stream. It's not forming the cave, it's just taking an easy route. However, these cha this chamber, this rather remarkable chamber, sits right under the lake of Lavpalavatn, which is, and uh, the water is all coming through cracks in the roof. Now, fairly unique, not typical, but this is what really wetted, see what I did there, my appetite for lava tubes. So from here, we had another about six or seven expeditions to Iceland, and lots and lots of amazing adventures. The pictures here are taken from a fantastic cave called Buri that was discovered by my friend Bjorn Rossen in 2005, which we helped him explore and survey. But we had many, many explorations in Iceland. Fabulous. We've surveyed, Bjorn reckons we've surveyed something like two-thirds of all the known caves in Iceland between us. On the back of these expeditions, I got involved with the Union, International Union of Speleology's Commission on Volcanic Caves, and I've been fortunate enough to explore caves in Mexico, Korea, Sicily, the Canary Islands. But in the short time we've got available, I need to talk about the main place, Hawaii. You can't talk about lava tubes and not talk about Hawaii. It is just simply the Mecca. The picture here is in the Kapuka Kanahina system, which is the second longest known lava tube on the planet. 46 kilometres of passage in a maze formation. It's growing at five to seven kilometres a year. You can see the sorts of formations you get, these wonderful levees showing how the, the lava flowed in that river through the cave. And you can also see something quite unique to Hawaii as well, which is the ohia roots. The ohia trees are very unique to Hawaii, and the roots penetrate into the caves to incredible depth. But... What has this got to do with British cavers? Because Kanahina is being pushed by the very, very competent cave conservation of Hawaii. Well, the first, amongst the very first speleological investigations on Hawaii was in 1979 by a British group led by our old friend Chris. And one of the caves they discovered was a cave called Kazumura Cave. This cave at the time, was unknown, and on that first trip, they mapped 12 kilometres of passage. Again, breaking the world length record for a lava tube. It's got a bit bigger since. It now boasts over 65 kilometres of passage. 101 entrances. The two furthest entrances are 30 kilometres apart as the crow flies. The through trip takes three days. It's got 17 pitches. It's, it's just, by any standards, limestone or lava, this is a cave that can hold its head up high with anyone. And it's not just about scale. There's incredible formations. This is known as the wow. And it's what's known as a blade formation. So this is close to a skylight, and in, in actually an area where there were two skylights close to each other. When the lava river was ripping through here, it was pulling hot gases and air through, which was actually rippling the surface of these rocks. It was also baking the surface of the rocks and and um, oxidising them into these fabulous colours. One of the big misconceptions about lava tubes is that they're black. They really ain't. Another feature in Kazumura Cave. This is a lava plunge pool. 
just behind the seated figure in this picture would have been a huge waterfall, a lava fall, about 12 metres high, 40 feet. The lava was throwing down there, huge gushing lava, and creating a plunge pool. At first glance, you might think that that cracked area was where the surface froze and the fluid underneath ran away. It didn't. That crack and drop is due to the contraction of the rock after it had cooled, or as it was cooling. One of the local cavers has estimated that that amount of contraction would require a plunge pool about 90 feet deep. That's 27 metres. It's quite something to think about. 27 metre deep lava lake. In my abstract, I promised you something out of this world, that the prospects for lava tube exploration were out of this world. And they are. Recent, or in the last 20 years, volcanoes have been found on a number of bodies in the solar system. And these pictures here show what can only be lava tube skylight collapses on Arcea Mons, volcano on Mars. They've also been seen on the Moon and on other bodies in the solar system. It's been postulated by many people now that these lava tube cave systems will form the basis of any human extended stay on these, these planets, whether it's Mars or the Moon. They will form the structure of the, uh, the habitats, which I guess will be slightly more than a wheelie bin. But what that means is that the, the techniques knowledge, and knowledge that we're building up about lava tubes on Earth are going to be absolutely vital to that first generation of astronauts who go and spend a long time on these bodies outside of the Earth. So in 20, 30, 40, 50 years' time, it may not be a volcano speleologist stood in front of you. It may be an exo-volcano speleologist. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ed.